uh, Luke chapter 4. And it says, And Jesus being, uh, verse, verse 1, I'll pause. Uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 1 says, And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when he and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stone this stone to be made into bread. And Jesus answered, saying, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that every word of God. And the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whosoever I give it. Verse 7. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Verse 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give thee, give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering unto him, It is said that thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Let's pray. Father, Lord Jesus, open up every heart. We ask you to open up our minds. Let us uh, heart be fertile ground, prepared, ready to receive your word, a seed to be planted, Lord God, to bring forth much fruit, Lord God, we ask you to prepare us, remove every distraction, every thought, Lord God, bring it into captivity, Lord Jesus, we ask you, God, just to have your way in this place, Lord God, that your word would come forth without hindrance, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you, and be seated. Uh, before I get into the word, congratulations to Mr. and Mrs. Aaron and so on for us. Congratulations. They just got married. So uh, I'm happy for y'all. We wish y'all many blessings and all the favor of God to be upon you. And this is let God continue to, to, to lead and guide you. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> so Luke chapter 4. Uh, verse 3, I want to read verse 3 one more time. And it says, And the devil said unto him, If, everybody say if, if, if thou be the Son of God, command the stone that it be made bread. Now, in these scriptures I just read to you, it's a familiar story. Everybody's heard about it when Jesus went into the wilderness, led by the Spirit. He fasted for 40 days, and at the end of that, the devil comes to him. Now, Jesus is found in this battle being tempted of Satan. And in the text, we see, the, see a battle that I believe that we all face very, very often. Um, it's a tactic of the enemy that he uses not only every day, not only today, but almost multiple times in a day. And you'll, get, you'll, you'll understand it. The, this tactic is a challenge against who we are. It's a challenge against I, our identity. Because he asked in verse 3, if thou be the Son of God, questioning Jesus' identity. If you're really the Son of God, turn that stone into bread. No, you're hungry. So today's message is going to be called identity theft. Identity theft. So I'm focusing on this because at Free Church, I have a question for you. Do you know who you are? There's so many people in the world today that are searching and doing things and, and going and experiencing things, trying to find out who they are. Do you know who you are? And, and if you don't, this is the message for you because I'm fixing to tell you exactly 
who you are. I want you to go to Romans. I'm, uh, like I said, I'm going to read a lot of scripture this morning. R Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Begin with verse 14. Who are you, church? Who are you? Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. All right, let's also go to Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, just a few pages over. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 says, For ye all... For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you that have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bound nor free. There is neither male nor female. For all are, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then according to Abraham's seed, you are heirs according to the promise. Now I'm going to jump back to Luke chapter 4. Now in Romans, it talked about you being the sons of God. Can somebody say amen? amen. How, many, how many are so grateful that, that God has said that over you? That you are a child of God. And so many times, the enemy will come and start to threaten that, to question that, to maybe even cause you to doubt that. That's his tactic, and you'll see that the reason Jesus went through the wilderness is the Spirit led him. It wasn't because the devil took him there, but when, when the devil came with his temptations, he endured that temptation to show us how to overcome. You are a child of God. John 1, chapter 12, Gospel of John. I'm going to go real quick. If you can join me with a quick anecdote. John chapter 1 and verse 12. You know, I had to jump into the Bible last night. Okay, John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, But as many as received him to them, he gave power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Okay? He's given power. So to them he received, who received him and believed on his name. To who? Them. Who's them? You. Me. To them he gave power become, to become sons of God. I want to read, because that, that's, that sounds all well and good, but I want to read for purpose the Amplified Version. Not, not so many years in God's name. John 1, 12, in the Amplified, says, But to as many as did receive and welcome him, do you welcome him this morning? He gave the right, the authority, and the privilege to become children of God. That is, to those who believe in adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. Who are, and I'll stop right there. No, I'm going to go ahead and go on. Who were born not of blood, natural conception, nor of the will of flesh, physical impulse, nor of the will of man, that of a natural father, but God, that is divine and supernatural birth, they are born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed, and sanctified. Who is that? 
Those are the people who have been given the power to become sons and daughters of God. The power, the authority. I got a question for you, and I'm going to ask you a lot of questions this morning. Have you received him? Based on what you just read, have you received him? Some people said, I want to say Jesus, my Lord and Savior. And, and there's no change, there's no sanctification, there's no change in their heart, their mind, their demeanor. There's no change at all. But they say they receive him. It's a profession, maybe even a confession, but is it a possession? Do you have him? Have you received him? Do you believe on his name? Because if you want to be given power to become the sons and daughters of God, it said you have to receive him and believe on his name. And do you believe in his name? Do you believe in the power of his name? See, if you do, then you are empowered to become the, become the sons and the daughters of God. And if you belong to God, the enemy wants to steal your identity. He's a thief. Right? John 10, 10 says, the, the thief cometh but to kill, steal, and destroy. What is he trying to steal, kill, and destroy? He's trying to steal, kill, and destroy you, who you are, how you identify with God, your relationship to God. He is constantly trying to rob that from you and me. Especially when you're led by the Spirit. See, how many know that when you were out there in the world doing your thing, you really weren't doing anything churchy, they didn't really feel like you were attacked by the enemy. There was no this, no spiritual battle, no nothing. And then all of a sudden, you know what, I'm going to give my life to God. And out of the woodwork, things start popping up. And that way, I feel attacked. I feel like enemies all around me. Why? Because the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is trying to steal what you're gaining. He's trying to kill your identity and destroy what God is creating in you. Especially when you're led by the Spirit. So when you start surrendering to the will of God and are being led by the Spirit, here comes battle. I'm not declaring anything over anyone. I'm just speaking from experience of reality. Luke chapter 4, where we were, in verse 1 says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Just a side note, because I want to make sure that you know that your wilderness experience is not does not mean that the devil sent you there. There's so many Christians that think, oh, I'm in a battle, I'm in a storm, and the devil's got me in the wilderness. That's not what the Bible says. Scripture says that the Spirit of God sent Jesus into the wilderness, and he went into fasting for 40 days. That is a level of discomfort that I do not like. I'm going to be honest with you right there. Fasting, that's tough. Right? I want you to be careful because some of us are rebuking the devil when it's the Spirit of God that's been leading us into the places that feel like wilderness, that feel like storms, that feel like problems. And it's the Spirit of God that's been leading us through that. Not always the enemy. And you've been rebuking the devil for it. See, God will lead you in a place where he can show you who you are and how you need to grow. Sometimes God will lead you in places that make you uncomfortable. The wilderness. Peter and the disciples were on a boat. And there was a storm raging. Not a very comfortable position. I want to remind you that Peter and these disciples, some of them were fishermen, professional fishermen. And they were disturbed and, and, and in fear and outside of their comfort zone in the storm and then all of a sudden Jesus comes out. They were out there because Jesus wanted them to be out there. And all of a sudden Jesus comes out and comes walking on the water. And what happened? Jesus wanted to show Peter the power that he could walk in if he would just understand that he was a son of God if he would believe. And he called him out of the boat. He said, walk on the water. Remember, he did walk on water. But but if you remember the story, and I know it's a basic story, but something, oh, let me back up. He steps out of the boat knowing who he is, knowing who Jesus is, confident in God, walking on water, and then something happens. 
Something stole his identity. Something stole his focus. Something stole his, his vision and caused him to doubt. That is the enemy at work all the time, stealing your identity. Stealing what God is telling you about you. He stole his identity. He caused him to say to Jesus, how to pull him out. He said, why did you doubt? You were walking. You were doing it. What happened? Church, the enemy is a thief. And he tries often to steal your identity any way that he can. In verse 3, it says, And the devil, the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone to be made into bread. If. If you're really who you are, who you say you are, is the first thing that the enemy will try to manipulate you into doubt. If. If he did that to, to eat, that was the first thing he did. That manipulation, that, that, that creation of doubt. Well, did, 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 did God really say that he would die? Can you really not eat of, a, of the fruit? Are you really going to die? You're not going to really die if you eat of it, was what the serpent said to Eve. He caused doubt. He caused doubt and made him question the word of God. If you're really the son of God, then do this. If you're really a daughter of God, then why aren't you doing that? If you're really a son of God, then why aren't you walking this way? Why aren't you walking that way? See, verse 3 is a question that will evoke a different response. It will evoke doubt. It will evoke pride. It will start to call you, are, are you really, are, if you are really the son of God, then, then why are you walking like that? Why are you acting like that? Anybody ever ask you? Yeah. And second, pride. Sometimes if, we'll be like, well, I am. And then you react, react to pride, and you go deeper into your flesh and not walking with the spirit. Pride. How many have made a mistake just reacting in pride, not by the Spirit? See, it's the if that sometimes causes us to doubt questions of our identity in Christ. It'll, it'll make us doubt who we are, who the Word says we are. It, that's if, if the enemy can get us to react in the flesh and to react not according to the Spirit, there's a difference. He can push us off our identity. Sometimes it don't take much to cause you to question your identity. And when I mean question your identity, you come in here, you're ready for church. How many have had this happen? You're ready for church. You're on your way to church. You got your mind right. And you got some worship music on. You're getting ready at home. And then all of a sudden, that person's getting on your nerves. Or, uh, or, or maybe you get in the car. Yeah, but you got it and everything. Okay, and or somebody drives by or whatever. Or you get to church and you're setting up sound and people are just, and all of a sudden you were in God, you were a godly man this morning, you were praying up, speaking the Holy Ghost in tongues all night long and all of a sudden you're like, we chose somebody. Anybody ever felt like that? That if, and then all of a sudden you're, you're fixing to stand behind the pulpit. Well, if you were mad at God, you would have been thinking those things. You would have been so frustrated. You would have been different. And I'm like, I got to overcome that. You see, the enemy will question you every single time. If he can get you off and start questioning who you are and start questioning. Uh, see, let me, let me let you a little secret. God's gifts and callings are without repentance, even when we mess up. Even when we mess up. And I'm not giving you a license to continue to mess up. I'm trying to show you what the enemy tries to do. To make you question yourself. Sometimes it don't take much, church. If, 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 if you're a woman of God, would you act like this? Now, some of those questions are true. And some of the times when we get frustrated and mad, it's because we know we shouldn't be acting like that. We show, we know we shouldn't be talking like that. We know we shouldn't be getting involved in those things. And we did anyway, and it hurt. And I'm so angry that we pointed it out. Amen. 
How about the if? If God really cared about me, this would be happening. There's another way if you have any trust in this one. If God really cared, I wouldn't be going through this. If God really cared, this is such and such wouldn't happen, and such and such thing wouldn't have, this wouldn't occur. If God really cared, God will cause doubt. If, I mean, Satan will cause doubt of, of, of your relationship to God if he cares for you. That big if. He's constantly messing with you, trying to mess with your identity. If, 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 if. So what did Jesus, what did he ask Jesus to do? Remember, Jesus had just fasted 40 days. He was hungry. Now, I've never fasted 40 days, church. I know you're shocked. But I've never fasted 40 days. Now, I fasted for very long periods of time, lengthy fast, and by the end of it, I was hungry. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about water, just water. I'm not talking about, I'm going to fast Coke. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm going to well, fast Facebook, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about fasting, fasting, not dieting, fasting. And I was hungry. Can you imagine by day 40 how Jesus felt? Now, don't think that because, oh, he, he, he's God. You know, he wasn't just like, this is so easy. No, he was a man, 100% man and 100% God. But he felt all the pain and all the hunger and all the temptation. He felt all that 40 days of temptation. 40, I'm sorry, 40 days of fasting. 40 days of hunger. That first day is hard. That second day, that third day is hard. You get to the sixth and seventh day, you're, I, I'm starting to see things. And get to the tenth day, I'm like, you know, 40 days? I can imagine. Lord, please don't come to 40 days. No, whatever you want, Lord, I'm yours. But, can you imagine 40 days? I would have I would have been like walking in the wilderness and seen a bush and, and imagine that was like a hamburger. Or you know, you see a rabbit run by and seen a hot dog. I don't know, I would have start seeing things or something. But that first so first comes that if, that temptation to fulfill his flesh. That's the temptation. If you are the Son of God, then feed your flesh. If you've got the power to do it, I don't know why not do it. See, the temptation is this. First, he questions his identity. If you're the son of God and you have the power, then go ahead and step outside of what the spirit is leading you to do and step into the flesh and feed your flesh. That's what that if does. Makes you start to feed your flesh. See, the spirit of God led him into the wilderness to fast for 40 days. And it didn't say that, all right, the fast was over. He says at the end of 40 days, the devil came. And at that end of 40 days, he was trying to make him fast the way he wanted him to pray fast. Amen? I'm going to say it again. The temptation to fulfill his flesh and to be led by his flesh is what that came from that if. See, the spirit had been leading him this whole time. And the enemy was trying to do was get him to be led by his flesh and not by the spirit. That's what happens when, when, when he questions your identity. He's trying to get you to be led by your flesh and not by the spirit. He does the same to us, church. We're doing good. We're in church. We're praying. We're in the spirit. And then all of a sudden, fill in the blank. Some, someone says something. Something happens. And the temptation to get into the flesh. See that? And so I'm going to reiterate what I said a minute ago. You're in church. You've been worshiping. And then something happens. You can, somebody, something, you, you, maybe you're not in church. Maybe you just left church. Have you ever just left church, got in the car, and got into an argument, or almost in a fight, road rage, whatever? That's God was leading you in the spirit, and then the enemy goes, let me tempt him and see if I can get him into the flesh. Let me tempt her and see if I can get her to the flesh. 
and he's trying to steal your identity. He's trying to rob everything he just took from you. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he's trying to do on a daily basis. The God, Lord, have me come out here and study this word and present it to you so that you can be prepared and know when the enemy's going to hit you, if I tell you, hey, in a minute I'm going to walk over there, I'm going to hit you right in your eye. Are you going to just stand there and take it or are you going to duck? Well, this is what the Lord's doing to you this morning. He is trying to teach you. This is what the enemy's trying to do to you on a daily basis. Be prepared. Last week, last message last week was preparation is an act of faith. In this entire row of, of, of sermons, these last three have all been about preparation, have all been about being ready. Are you ready? The temptation is to react in the flesh. I was doing good, but this happened. I was doing good, but somebody said this, and all of a sudden, I found myself blank, not doing this. Again, church, I remind you, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, what's the answer to this? Okay, I've, I've poured enough and repetitively told y'all what he's doing. What is the answer? Verse 4 says, Jesus answered unto him, saying, it is written. Everybody say, it is written. It is written. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Did you catch it? Are you being led by the word of God? Are you being led by what God says about you? When that situation and that temptation arises, are you being led by the Spirit? See, the Spirit... His word tells you who you are. And that, 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 that temptation to step off into the flesh, you either have to say, no, no, no. I, I can, I can uh, get angry and sin not. The scripture says, I can be angry. It's all right to get emotional. But it also says that not to sin. So I, according to his word, I'm going to stand upon that word. I'll be angry. It's all right. I'm going to get frustrated, but I'm not going to sin. That's who I am. That's who he said I am. Amen. And you stand upon that word. You don't allow excuses to, to drive you into this and to drive you into that. That's not, that's not who you are. That's not who God says you are. I will be led by God's word. I will be led by his spirit and not let anything steal this from me. That's, that's, I want, I, want, I want everyone to confess this. I will be led by God's word. Everybody, not just you. I will be led by God's word. I will be led by God's word. No, shy. I will be led by his spirit. And I will not let anything steal this from me. No matter what's going on. No matter what the situation is, church. No matter what's going on, no matter what the situation, no matter the, the opportunity, no matter how justified that you are to go, I'm going to get you right there, I'm justified. No matter that, God can say, no, 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 son, led by the Spirit, not the flesh. Because if you're a son of God, you are what? As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. They are the sons and daughters of God. They are the children of God. They, if you're led by the Spirit, that's who is a child of God. And if you know your Bible, then you can respond to the enemy like Jesus responded. Oh, time out, it's written. No, I'm not going there. You're not giving me this time, bro. It is written that I respond this way. It is written that I'm supposed to act this way. It is written that I am not I'm not going to stand. I'm not going to get into that. I am more than a conqueror. I've been delivered from this temptation, that temptation, this temptation. I've been set free. All my bondages are broken. I've been. I am delivered. I'm no longer going to get back into that because that's not who I am. The old man has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what God said about me. Amen. I'm not going to get back into the flesh. I'm not going to get back into the flesh. I'm not going to give myself excuse. And church, when, when you know your word, and I, and I encourage you, get into your word, read your Bible cover to cover, read it through over and over again, study specific things, but, but know your word for well, this one reason, so when the enemy comes and, and, and he messes with you, you could say, it is written. Yeah. 
Because you can combat him with the word because the word of God is more powerful than any situation that you'll ever go through. You can declare over any situation, any problem. I'm going to read verse 5 and 6. And the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All the power I will give thee and, and the glory of them, for, for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I give it. So he's offering him power. He's offering him glory. Here's another way the enemy wants to steal, steal your identity. What did he ask him to do? Verse 7. If thou wilt worship me, all shall be thine. So he tries to steal your worship. Now, I don't know if this happened to you this morning, uh, but it's happened to me before. When the enemy tries to steal your worship. And I'll give you an example. Some of them are minor. Some of them, you come in here, they put the music on, you're like, I don't know about that song. I don't like, yeah, I don't like that song. That's not the song. You know, whatever. He stole your worship. Um, or, Again, you just had a frustrated moment right before worship started, and you're like, I can't get that out of my head. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. And then you're, you're, and then three songs are gone, and you're like, I can't get to worship. I just had my eyes closed, and I was like, Heaven, Jesus, Heaven, Jesus, Heaven. You know, the worship has been stolen. He tries to steal your worship. He said, If you worship me, if you bow down to me, then I'll give you all this. Church is trying to steal your worship. If he can steal your worship, he can steal your identity. He can steal who you are. And how does he do that? Sometimes it's through literal worship. Sometimes it's in church. And sometimes he steals your worship by presenting idols. Different things to put in the place of God. What is an idol? Anything that you put before God, you have made an idol. A person, a place, a thing, your finances, your job, a relationship. If you put it before God, it is you have now taken, literally, I want you to imagine this God sitting on the throne. You say, excuse me, can, can you come over here for a second? Sit over here. Okay, I'm going to put this person on the throne because they're aggravating me. I don't want you to be on the throne. I want that person to be on the throne because that's who I'm focused on. That's exactly what we're doing. It's putting that person on the throne and putting Jesus to the side. It's an idol. See, when we think of idols, and we think of these statues and, and these other things and, and different religions that have these different idols, and it's not, those are not just the idols. Yes, those are idols. But those are the only idols. Some idols are what we've created in us, in our hearts, and things that we've taken and taken the place of God. Is there anything that you've allowed to take the place of God? Maybe in the past, hopefully not right now, but maybe you've allowed things to take in the past. And here's the question. How do you know if you've made it an idol, has it stolen your identity? Has it caused you to take, will you allow anything to put you into the flesh? Get you into the flesh, get you frustrated. I'm not saying you can't get frustrated, church. And I don't want to give the old cliche, we're all human. God said, if any, if, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those have become given power to put the Son. How many want to be a son and a daughter of God? Amen. Amen. Anything, anything that you put before God is an idol. If you, if you, if something is stealing your attention, stealing your worship, stealing your focus on God, I just want to remember. Be careful because the enemy is trying to create idols in your life so that you, instead of worship God, you're worshiping something else. You may not be literally bowing down to the church, but you're worshiping something else because you've replaced that with God, that relationship with God. That person, that thing. What have you placed on the throne ahead of God? Some people put a person. Some people put kid, their kids. I'm not going to let 
That's a simple one right there. Uh, how about your comfort? Mm, today's, uh, uh, no, I'm, no, I know God, you're telling me to go to church. I know you're telling me to fast. No, I'm not doing that either. It's comfort. Sometimes comfort is your idol. Have you ever thought about that? I've, 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 I've God called me to fast. I think that's kind of to be honest with you. You know, I've, I've made those mistakes. And I know I made those mistakes. God calls us to specific things in our lives. And all of a sudden, we go for comfort. We go for this. We go for that. And we take him off the throne. And we put that thing on the throne. Satan told Jesus, worship me. And, and what did he offer him? Verse 6 says, and the devil, all the power I will give unto thee and the glory of them. For this was delivered to me and whomsoever. Whoever I want to, I can give it to you in, in, in that show. So he offers them power and authority. He offers them power and authority without process and without the cross. So let me give you an example. He says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. All the kingdoms. Well, why did Jesus come? For all the kingdoms of this world. He says, I'll give it to you. I'll give you what you want. And you don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to hurt. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to bleed. You don't have to go through any pain. I'll give it to you. Trying to call them out of this purpose. Trying to call them out of, out of what, what the Spirit has been leading them to, to and through the entire reason for his existence. Satan will try to get you off and offer you what you want without process, without the cross, without you having to pick up your cross. Jesus said you have to pick up your cross and follow me. What is your cross? Sometimes it's doing things the right way. See, you can gain a lot of things by doing them the wrong way. Right? But you have to go through process. You have to do things right in the sight of God. Be careful you're not trying to do what you want and removing God in order to get it. I want to say that one more time. Be careful you're not trying to get what you want by removing God to get it. Let's go to verse, verse 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written. Now, so, now we'll stop right there. I was reading Matthew, and Matthew doesn't say, Get thee behind me, Satan. And the reason why Jesus had me come over here, and it said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Is going to be the end. Uh, so, to remind you, don't let me forget verse 8 is connected to verse 13. It is written. So, he said, It is written. And then, verse 9, he says, And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, there he is again, asking if you're really the Son of God, then cast yourself down from me. Throw yourself down. And when the angels catch you, when all those people see you down there, can you imagine? Okay, he takes him to the temple and looks down, and there's all these people down there in the temple. So why don't you just cast yourself down? You know the angels are going to catch you. Everybody's going to see that you're the Messiah. You ain't got to go to the cross again. The, the Bible says, and it's funny because. Twice Jesus tells him, it is written. It is written. And then Satan goes, all right, smart pass. I'm going to use it on you. Then he goes to verse 9, and he says, cast yourself down from here. And then verse 10 says, for it is written. Now this is Satan talk. Now he's going to quote the Bible of Jesus. Now he's going to quote the word of God of Jesus. Say, for it is written, he shall give angels charge over thee to keep thee. Verse 11. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, unless any time your foot gets you, any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. The enemy is trying to steal your identity, trying to cast you off your purpose, trying to cast you off your calling. See, if he can distract you from your calling and your purpose, church, then he can steal who you are. Because you can be doing something good. And it not be your calling. 
You could be shooting to something great. You could be doing something that, that, that's honorable. It's not, it's not just about sin. But are you in the will of God? Are you in the purpose of God? See, this distraction of your identity, what, what are you called to do? What is your purpose in God? And if, he, if the enemy can push you off of that, then he's got your identity. He's got you. Because you're no longer accomplishing what God's called you to do. Amen. Church, I want to go to verse. Oh, and Jesus answered unto him and said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And verse 13 said, And when the devil had ended all, the temptation, he departed from him for a season. So remember when I told you just a minute ago? And, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm coming to a close. Remember when I told you just a minute ago in verse 8 that it said, Get thee behind me, Satan. And I didn't see that in the other, in the other gospel. And then right here, very, then at the very end, he says, And when the Satan, Satan had, had ended all his temptation, he departed from him for a season. Church, this is exactly what Jesus was trying to show you. No matter how many times the enemy challenged who you are, no matter how many times he says, if you're really the son of God, if you're really the daughter of God, if you're really called by God, if, if you're really delivered, if you're really saved, if you're, if you're really, if, 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 all these ifs, then what's going to happen is, is, is Jesus says, if you just tell me it is written, I'm going to be led by the Spirit. I'm going to be led by what God told me. It is written. This is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to have idols before me. I'm not going to bow down and worship you, Satan. I'm not going to bow down and worship the person that caused me, caused me to get frustrated. I'm not going to change my ways just because this happened, that happened. I know who I am in God now. And I'm not going to allow me, myself to, to be submitted to come to these fleshly things. He was trying to get Jesus into the flesh by making bread and by worshiping him and by casting himself down. I mean, what kind of... That was like the, the devil's temptation of the church. I don't know. I, I, don't, I kind of feel like Jesus is like, what do you mean? Like, hey, throw yourself off this roof. And who goes for that? Unless you're 12 and you've got a kite with an umbrella and you're trying to fly. Who goes for that? Throw yourself off this roof. I mean, he'll come to you with nonsense sometimes just to break you off of what God is trying to call you to do. And it's all, is it, the whole key to this is, is if you're a son of God, then you're led by the spirit and not the flesh. Church, and the whole thing that God is trying to teach us the entire time is every time he responded, I'm going to respond in the spirit. I'm going to respond in the spirit. I'm going to respond in the spirit. I'm not going to allow my flesh to take control and make me want to eat some bread that was turned from stone. I'm not going to allow myself to try to gain this by worshiping that. Because that's not exactly what, that's not what God wanted me to do. I'm going to be led by the Spirit. I'm not going to throw myself off this roof so that I can be seen. I'm not, I'm not, this, it's not about me. It's, it's as many as led by the Spirit. They are the sons of God. And Scripture says that He endured temptation and showed us all that we can resist. What did He do the entire time? He resisted the devil. And scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee. Church, we don't have to give in. To many of us, it takes this, this, this temptation, this small of a temptation, this small of a devil, this small of, a, of, of something that's going on in our lives to cause us to quit walking in the spirit. And God's calling us higher this morning. God's calling us to a different level of commitment and, 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 and just giving yourself to him and saying, I'm not going to quit any longer. I'm, I'm tired of failing. How many? I have, I have failed too many times in my life, and I don't want to do it anymore. And Jesus is saying, "You don't have to, because if you know what I said about you, and you know what I said, it is written that you know that you are a child of God. You know that you're a son of God, and you don't have to react to the flesh. I don't care if somebody gets in your face. I don't care what they said on Facebook. I don't care what the enemy said. I don't care what's going on in your world. I don't care if the if if if." if the hospital comes and says you're sick. He says, but by his stripes they healed. It's written. I don't care what they said. By his stripes, I am healed. He said, I know that I'm depressed, but joy comes in the morning. It's said in the scripture. I can have joy. It's coming. I'm looking for it. It's not always going to be this way. There's so much stuff that can help us when people don't know their word. They don't know who they are. They don't know that it is written. 
This is what this is true about you. He loved you so much that he gave you a whole love book to say, this is who you are, church. This is who I am. I'm tired of walking in the flesh. I want to walk in the spirit. I want to be a son of God. And I ask you, church, to hold yourself to another level of accountability so that you can truly become, you can truly claim to be a Christian, a little Christ, a son of God, a daughter of God, because God has been calling you higher. I know you're in this little new church, and it's just new person, but he's calling you higher. He's calling you to more. He's calling you to more separation, to more consecration, to more holiness. And it's not going to be comfortable at times. And he may lead you into a wilderness. And he may lead you to a place of fasting and consecration. But he's going to show you who you are. He's going to show you the power that you can walk in. And I want to remind you before we close, one more thing. Because if you have been given power to become sons of God, then he said you are joint heirs with him. And what did he say? He said, greater things will you do than what you've seen me do. He says, if you believe, you will cast out devils. If you believe, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. All these many wonderful works that he said we can do if we know who we are, if we're truly the sons and daughters of God. Let's stand. I, I don't know where you've been this this morning or what you've been going through, but here's what I do know. I believe that this is a word of God for anybody that's listening to this over the internet, over the phone, or in person. I know that God has been calling you greater because there's no coincidence that you're listening to this now. And God said it's time to put away childish things and to start walking in the spirit and no longer the flesh. No longer giving yourself excuse. No longer giving myself excuse to be fleshly. How many want to be a son of God?